What's up guys, David or one, two, and two, and it's list day. Ah yes, list day, and today we're using list day to continue my teaching Yu-Gi-Oh series by going over the top 10 most common Yu-Gi-Oh terms you need to know if you are a new player to the game. Ah, uh, it is no mystery that most cards worth their salt are wall of texts. Therefore, if you are in a tournament setting where there is a time crunch and you don't think you can read every single card your opponent has, although I would recommend it if you can, you may ask your opponent, what does that one do? And your opponent may choose to explain the card by reading it out loud or using shorthand. It's that Yu-Gi-Oh shorthand that could be confusing to a player who's never heard it before. And that's what we're going over. Hopefully this is quick, educational, and uh, we can have some fun with it. I'm going to try to keep the list to things that are uniquely terms in Yu-Gi-Oh. There are some terms that are just generally used in other card games that uh, I'll probably mention as honorable mentions, but these are like inherently Yu-Gi-Oh jargon. They also, things like piercing or GY are official game terms for things, that even though they are shorthand, those don't count. Those are in the rule book. These are stuff the players have made up at some point. But anyway, let's go. Number 10, towers. When a player says that this monster that they have on their board is a towers-like monster or is a towers, they are making a reference or metaphor to Applica for Towers. I actually pronounced that right on the first go. Probably not. What do they mean? Well, it's normally a monster with a larger attack power and some sort of inherent self-protection that makes it a pain in the butt to get off the board. Someone might refer to Ultimate Falcon as a Towers because it's like unaffected by everything. It's hard to get rid of. That's because Towers himself has an inherent protection effect. And it was the boss monster of the deck and Towers Turbo was a, a meta version of that deck. So therefore that big bad boss monster saw lots of competitive play in a very, very diverse and largely played format. So therefore the term kind of stuck. Number nine, inherent and non-inherent special summons. Of all the things on this list that should probably be actually officially recognized terms, it's probably these two, because they're a very quick and easy way to explain different types of special summons. However, they are actually fan terms, so we need to mention them here. An inherent special summon is probably the easiest one to understand. It's a special summon of a monster that is not done by a card effect. Something like Black Luster Soldier Envoy the Beginning, does not activate an effect in order to put itself on board. It's an inherent summoning condition of the card. It's inherent to the card, hence the source of the name. Non-inherent special summons are a little more hairy. The easy ones are things like anything summoned by polymerization or a ritual spell, where it's obviously summoned by a card effect because it's an entirely different card summoning the, the monster. Where it gets a little weird is when it's like, and I can easily screw this up explaining it, Toon Harpy Lady? where it's an activated effect in your hand in order to summon the card. The effect is actually the effect of the monster you're trying to summon, yet it's not inherent because it's an activated effect, meaning your opponent would be able to chain an activation of something to that. It's a little wonky when it comes down to the effect of the monster itself is summoning itself. That's when it gets a little hairy. It's easier when it's like spells or traps doing it or other monsters for that matter. However, the best way to tell the difference is normally with the problem solving card text, you can tell by the various punctuation in the effect, what is cost, what is an activation condition, and so on and so forth. The best I can do is be as generic as possible, which makes me sound like I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> so if you have a question whether your monster is inherent or not inherent, put it in the comments, we will go over it. It's, it's really a case by case. It's also a thousand degrees in here, and this is the millionth time I've recorded this video. Number eight, floodgate. Was that on purpose? A floodgate is any kind of continuous effect that stops you from doing stuff. Most of the time you'll find them on things like continuous trap cards, like Imperial Order or Vanity's Emptiness, that specifically tell you you can't do something. Things like Jinzo or Denko Seka could also be considered floodgates because they stop certain game actions, even though they are monsters. Floodgates traditionally must be a continuous or continuous-like effect. The good ones only act on one player, preferably your opponent. And they're also no fun to play against. Spell Speed 4! I hate this one because it's really, really deceiving in that it sounds like it might actually be an official game term, but it's completely made up and doesn't even quite accurately describe what it is. Previously in this series, we talked about what spell speeds are and how when you have a chain in Yu-Gi-Oh, 
You can only activate a card in response to another card if it has a like or greater spell speed. A spell speed 3 is a counter trap card and only a counter trap card, meaning that if you use a counter trap card, your opponent can only chain with another counter trap card because it's the only thing else in the game that is also spell speed 3. Spell speed 3 is the fastest spell speed in Yu-Gi-Oh! There is no such thing as spell speed 4. What people mean when they say a spell speed 4 is something like super polymerization, which by the card's effect says your opponent or you or whatever, depending on the card itself, cannot activate anything in response to the card. Super Poly, for instance, is actually spell speed 2 because it is a quick play spell card, but, but because it has the condition that it cannot be chained to, like it's almost the fastest spell speed because your opponent can't do anything about it. It's just misleading, but it is a quick way of describing a card. No, it is not faster than a counter trap, even though you can't use a counter trap against it. The only time this distinction, however, would actually come up is if it's a card that your opponent cannot chain to, but you chain to it, and then your opponent can then chain to that. It's in situations like that where something like Super Poly Spell Speed 2 actually matters. Number six, back row. Back row is a uh, very Yugi because we have two rows in Yu-Gi-Oh! The front row, which is traditionally your monsters, and the back row, which is traditionally your spells and traps, when you are looking at your playing field. When somebody says they're going to play a back row heavy deck, that must mean that they there are for are playing a bunch of spells and traps, most likely traps. And if you're putting in some back row destruction in your side deck in order to deal with said back row deck, you are putting something like Mystical Space Typhoon, a Lightning Storm, or some other thing that destroys spells and traps in order to deal with their back row. Number five, Hand Trap. There's no way we did this on purpose like this. Hand Trap's also pretty close to being an official game term. I'm pretty sure I've even heard some Konami announcers use it because it's an extremely easy and effective way of describing exactly what it is. There are certain monsters in this game with spell speed to monster effects that can be activated in the hand by either summoning them or putting them in the graveyard as a discard cost. Something like Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring can be sent to the graveyard from your hand to stop your opponent from using a search card. People call this a hand trap because it is a negation or some sort of player interaction you are using to respond to your opponent's game action without actually having to have a card on the board. It's a trap-like card in your hand. Interestingly enough, we do have cards like Evenly Matched and Infinite Impermanence that are actually literal trap cards that can be used from the hand, so they are even more, in this sense, literal hand traps. However, the term does kind of include anything that you're activating in your hand in response to something. Number four, Garnet. Based on Gem Knight Garnet, a 1900 level four vanilla monster played with the Brilliant Fusion Engine. Brilliant Fusion is a continuous spell card that allows you to fusion summon a Gem Knight monster from your extra deck by dumping the materials from your deck. This is great because you don't have to have them in your hand, pretty much just free and you can activate it whenever you want. The caveat is the monster that you normally are summoning is Gem Knight Seraphonite, which requires a Gem Knight monster. Most of the Gem Knight main deck monsters don't do too much, so players, when they wanted to use the Brilliant Fusion engine, they would play Gem Knight Garnet because it's a level four with the biggest attack power. So if you did happen to draw it, you could at least summon it and maybe crash over something. And that is where we get the term Garnet, describing any card that you have in your main deck that is part of some sort of engine that you don't want to draw. You want to keep it in your deck and pull it out of your deck in order to do some sort of wombo combo. Normally when you draw your Garnet, it's a bad thing because it probably turns something off. For instance, that Brilliant Fusion does not work if you have the Garnet in your hand. Number three, Infernity Barrier. Infernity Barrier is a counter trap card of the Infernity Archetype that just like negates everything. When someone refers to an archetype's card as this is their Infernity Barrier, most likely they are referring to an in archetype support card that is a counter trap that has some sort of blanket omni negation like spells, traps, and monster effects or summons and spells or something, just negates a wide range of things. Something like that Orcist thing. It's a crescendo. You can really tell I don't play meta decks. <laughs> Number two, MST. MST is an acronym standing for Mystical Space Typhoon, referring to the quick play spell card that destroys one spell or trap on the field. If a card is an MST or MST-like effect, the person saying this is most likely saying that the card destroys spell or traps. Whether that is a spell speed one or spell speed two effect kind of depends on the player. Normally you're referring to a card like Tornado Dragon, which is a spell speed two. However, some people do consider anything that destroys spell or traps, regardless of its spell speed, as an MST-like effect. 
All right, we do have a few honorable mentions. The reason why these are honorable mentions is because they're extremely common terms. They're really, really quick to explain, but they also are, they're like from Magic the Gathering and other card games and it's their origins all over the place. So they're not inherently Yu-Gi-Oh, but I'll go over them really quick. A pop, normally a targeted destruction. Spin, normally a targeted return to the deck. Bounce, a targeted return to the hand. Scoop, to surrender. Beat stick, a large monster that doesn't really do anything. It just sits on board with a big attack power. It may or may not actually really have any kind of effect. It's just there as an attack presence putting pressure during the battle phase. In modern Yu-Gi-Oh, this kind of has a negative connotation because if a monster is just a beat stick, it means it has an attack power and doesn't do anything. It's not very good. Last but not least, Mill. Actually, definitely from Magic the Gathering because I'm pretty sure it's based on the Millstone card, meaning to send a card from your deck directly to the graveyard to mill a card out of your deck. Some decks do this on purpose in order to set up their graveyard, and some other decks do it to their opponent in an attempt to get a deck out win. Thank you so much guys for watching the video. If you guys want to help support the channel, check out my links down in the description below. I've got links to the Discord, Facebook, and Patreon if you want to get in touch with me, help with the lists, things like that. Or if you want to save some money, you can head over to Metamat's website, use my code TROLLMETA at checkout, you can save 10% off a custom cloth playmat like one of these bad boys. Or if you want to waste your money on expensive cardboard, use my TCG player link in the description below and put off your financial obligations. And number one, the most likely thing you're going to run into in Yu-Gi-Oh! that is a Yu-Gi-Oh! jargon fan term is Rota. Rota stands for Reinforcements of the Army, referring to a normal spell card that searches one warrior monster from your deck level 4 or lower. Someone may refer to a card as a Rota if you play it and then you get to add a monster from your deck to your hand. It doesn't necessarily have to be a, a normal spell card. Something like the new UA field spell that you play it to the field spell zone and it searches a card from your deck. It could be called a Rota even though it's a field spell not a normal spell. And by further extension, something like Elemental Hero Stratos could be considered a Rota because he searches cards from the deck. Side note, if you don't like calling monsters that search cards Rotas, some people do call them Stratoses. Same thing. All right, guys, I hope you found this a little bit educational and uh, hopefully it was kind of fun. You know, just because it's quick, down and dirty, possibly interesting for those newer players to the game. Anyway, you guys, I hope you enjoyed it. Let me down in the comments below if you have any questions about that inherent, non-inherent thing, because uh, yeah, that's probably going to be a big thing. And remember guys, if you don't troll the matter who will, I'm going to turn my air conditioner back on. Holy crap. Just a quick special thank you to all my supporters over on Patreon. You guys make the whole channel possible. You guys have no idea how much it means to me that you guys do that. If you guys want to be part of the Goblet Attack Force, link for the Patreon down in the description below. Dueling takes both luck and skill. Show this by pressing the subscribe and notification buttons now. Bear witness to these other Davinator 1212 videos. Hmm? Odeon! What is it, Master? It's time to apply the ointment. Mm. Come help me with this. I should have left with Ishizu. I can't reach.